So I was thinking about uh, what to teach on during the Christmas season. I'm going to be a little bit honest. Uh, for, for a pastor, it's, it's kind of hard. Christmas is, is tough um, because there's only so many messages about shepherds and wise men that I have in me, right? You know, there's only so many times. And so you, 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 you think about things and you, and you think about, you know, uh, you, you try to be clever, like how can I approach this from a different angle? But then you start thinking, you know, I'm dealing with the Word of God here. I'm dealing with, with a message from, from my Creator. And so probably, like, I shouldn't try to be overly clever with it um, because this is God's Word that I'm dealing with. And, and so, um, so over the past couple of years, I've been doing messages that aren't necessarily exactly Christmas messages from texts that aren't exactly Christmas texts. I mean, they go along with the Christmas stories. A couple of years ago, we did a, we did a series called This Ain't a Christmas Series, and it was about faith, hope, and love. And the idea was that faith, hope, and love, these are three things that we kind of think about during Christmas time, but, but it shouldn't really just be relegated to Christmas. It should be something that we, we kind of try to, to, to put into practice all year long and how so many times we, we act differently during the Christmas season than we act at other times in the year. And, um, and so this year, I want to look at John chapter 1 this year. It's not exactly what we would think of as a Christmas uh, passage, um, but it is a Christmas passage because it's a story of Jesus' origin. And the main reason that I want to look at this one is I think it's, it's one of the most overlooked stories of Jesus' origin. You know, we think about Christmas, what do we think about? What, what did Linus talk to Charlie Brown about, right? He, he read out of Luke chapter 2, said, Unto you was born in, this, in the city of David, a Savior is, is Christ the Lord. We think about Luke chapter 2. Um, that's an, an origin story of Jesus, that Jesus is the Savior of the world. Luke actually traces Jesus' lineage all the way back to Adam, all the way back to the very beginning. He's the, he's the Savior of the world, the promised Savior of the world. And we've got, you know, in Matthew, you know, there's, there's four... Uh, books, four Gospels in the New Testament that give us the story of Jesus, right? And, and so Luke, and they kind of hit it from different angles. They bring out different points. And, and Luke tells us, you know, that Jesus is the Savior of the world. Matthew tells us, he says, uh, he traces Jesus' lineage back to Abraham and tries to show him as the King of the Jews and uh, the, the, the promised Jewish Messiah. Uh, Mark, that's, that's an interesting story. Mark doesn't really have, he, he still has his own orange, origin story. Starts in Mark chapter 1, says this is the gospel of Jesus, the Son of God. That's about all it says. You know, so here's Jesus. He is from God. He's, he's the Son of God. And then in, in, in Mark, uh, in verse 9, in Mark chapter 1, verse 9, he goes on and he says, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth. Say, so Mark, where did he come from? Well, Nazareth. You know, he's, he's kind of this. So there's a lot of truth to that. Jesus, we know about Jesus' birth through the other Gospels. We know that he was the Son of God. But, but in Mark, we see Jesus kind of appearing out of nowhere. You know, where did he come from? Where did this guy come from? I don't know. This guy, he's like, he's like a carpenter's son, and he, he comes from Nazareth. I don't even know where Nazareth is. And uh, so he just kind of pops up out of nowhere. And we learn a lot about Jesus through that, that Jesus is, is, was, as far as the world was concerned, was kind of this no account kind of guy comes from just an average middle class family in a small town up in, up in northern Israel. And he's just kind of ordinary. He comes from an ordinary family. He's kind of an ordinary village and he just kind of shows up. Right? And all of these are true. Jesus, from the world's perspective, if you put yourself back in, in the time when he was back in the first century here, Jesus kind of did appear to just kind of pop up out of nowhere. And Jesus was the fulfillment. We can trace him all the way back to the promises of Abraham. He is the fulfillment of these, of these promises of a Messiah to the, to the Jewish people. And he can be, as Luke does, he can be traced all the way back to Adam. He is the Savior of the world. But John goes back even further. John takes it back even further. Yes, this guy shows up out of Nazareth. Yes, he's the fulfillment of, of the promises to Abraham. Yes, he is the Savior of the world. But before the world even began, before Adam, before time even was invented, in the beginning was the Word, Jesus. Where did he come from? He came from the beginning. He came from before the beginning. And he was there in verse, verse 1, it says, or in verse 2, he was there in the beginning with God. And he was there with God when God made everything. And in case you're not sure what that means, that means he, he, he was the one that made everything. He was God. He is God. And he made everything. And then he says in verse 3, one more, one more time, just in, case, just in case you're not quite sure, nothing that was made was made 
without him. And so this morning, a lot of times our Christmas stories, they start with Mary. They start with Joseph. They start with a baby in the manger. But John's Christmas story goes way back. Way back before the beginning, before time even began. And he starts with, with God. It starts with who Jesus is. And it's, it's overlooked. You know, I don't know, you know, when you think about with your family, I don't know if you, you know, gather around the Christmas tree on Christmas Eve or something like that and read the Christmas story. I know the, uh, the children back there, they're going to be basically just reading the Christmas story uh, together in their classes this morning. I don't know that any of them are reading the Gospel of John. I don't know that any of them are reading John chapter 1, you know. We, we start our Christmas stories off with Mary and shepherds, and, and that's good. But this is kind of an overlooked Christmas story, and it is a Christmas story. But I mean, it's one that's, that's super important because not only was Jesus a great man, not only was he this great human that, that did this amazing thing that sacrificed himself for us, but he was, we believe he was God. He is the Word of God. He's the image of God, and he is God himself in the flesh. Right? And, so, and so we see that. And I, I want to just kind of go through these first few chapters or first few verses this morning and then we're going to continue it on next week and the week after um, and just kind of look through, uh, through the first half of John chapter 1 and just kind of see who Jesus is kind of on the big scale, like the overview, the flyover view, view of who Jesus is. Um, so in the beginning, starts off in verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. And we know that's referring to Jesus it's, it's interesting, you know, these first nine verses, it's the story of the origins of Jesus. doesn't have the word Jesus in it one time. He calls him the Word. He calls him life. He calls him the light. Um, but he doesn't use the name Jesus. Now, he, he will go on as you get into the Gospel of John. He'll use the word Jesus and, and, and call him by his name first off. But he's trying to show us a little bit of who Jesus is. He's comparing, him, comparing Jesus to a few different things here. He calls him the Word. Which that, that kind of seems a little bit strange, especially if you think about it in terms of the first, you know, we, we've got 2,000 years of history behind us. So we're probably, most of us in this room are probably used to Jesus being referred to as the Word. But I can imagine in the first, first uh, century, you know, in the beginning was the Word. So you call this guy the Word, that doesn't really make sense. Well, he's comparing him. He's, he's trying to make, uh, trying, to, trying to compare him in, in, to, to words that we know to help us to understand who he is. And the word here in, in the Greek is the word logos. Everybody say logos. All right, that's pretty good. And, and the word logos can mean either word or wisdom or both. Uh, it can be interchangeable. And, and, and you might think, well, how, that doesn't make sense. How can a Greek, one Greek word be translated into two different English words? How does that work? Well, if you think about words for a minute with me, words are powerful. They, they really are. How many of y'all have experienced something in your life where words are very powerful? You know, either words of, of love or words of affirmation or, or words on the other side, words of, of, of hatred or, or anger can be very powerful. They can have a very powerful impact on it. On us. You've probably heard the old adage, the pen is mightier than the sword. Anybody ever heard that one before? Right? I mean, when I was a kid, I used to think like sword and a pen. How would you sword fight with a pen? How is that more powerful? And clearly the sword is more powerful. No, what it's talking about is, you know, someone can put a gun to my head and they can change my behavior. Someone puts a gun to my head and tells me to do something, I'm probably going to do it. Right? But they can't change my heart. They can't change my mind. They can't change my deeply held convictions of the nature of reality. Only words can do that. You put a gun to my head, you can get me to act a certain way, but you can't get me necessarily to feel a certain way. Other than fear, you can get me to feel that. But you, but you can't get me, you can't change the nature of my convictions and my deeply held beliefs about the nature of reality. Right? Now maybe if, if I'm in a moment of weakness, maybe you can get me to act in a, in a way that's contrary to my deeply held convictions about the way that things are. But you can't change my heart. Words are powerful. That's something only words can do. Words can change what we think. Words can change what we feel, right? In a way that, uh, that a weapon or that, that anything else can't do. Words are powerful, but on the other hand, I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, on the other hand, words are nothing. You can't, you can't hold a word in your hand. You can't touch a word. You can't go to the, the grocery store and buy three pounds of, of words. Right? Words are powerful, but words are nothing. Right? And, so, and, so Jesus, and so John is he's getting a little philosophical here, honestly. And so we're going to have to, if we're going to understand what he's saying, we're going to have to follow him down this rabbit hole just a little bit. But if you've ever, if you've ever thought about um, 
the saying, those are wise words, right? There's nothing wise about the sounds necessarily that are coming out of my mouth if they're wise words. It's, 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 it's when our brains understand those sounds and give meaning to those sounds. Does that make sense? If you think about profanity, right? There's nothing inherently evil about the f sound followed by the, you know where I'm going, right? There's nothing inherently evil about those sounds. It's when I say those sounds and our brains give meaning to those sounds, that's when they become a problem because it's offensive and, and, and it may offend somebody or hurt somebody's feeling. That's the problem. Does that make sense? Right? So, so this is how this all fits together. Words don't have meaning unless our minds, our wisdom gives them meaning. Right? And we can't communicate the wisdom and the things that we know without words. Not, not even to ourselves, because we think with words, right? You can't, we can't communicate the things that we know, even to myself, without using words. If I don't know the word for, for freedom, I can't think about this concept of freedom. You know, if I, how many of y'all in here know a, a little bit about dogs? Right? Nobody? Anybody know a little bit about dogs? All right. Think about trying to tell somebody or even tell yourself what you know about dogs without using the words dog, leash, bark, or, or fur, or any of the names of any dog breed. It would be very, very difficult. Even you may be the, the, the greatest expert in the world on dogs, but it would be very, very difficult to communicate that to someone without using those words. And this is where it all kind of comes together. This is, some of y'all, you know, and we've had to get a little philosophical because that's what John's doing here. And some of y'all, the last five minutes, and you've been like, yeah, this is awesome. I love this. And some of y'all, the last five minutes, have been like, this is like the stupidest thing I've ever heard. But okay, if that's you, then, then kind of, you know, this is where it all kind of turns around and comes home. And this is, this is where, where we need to understand and to apply it to our lives. What John is saying here is that Jesus is the word of the Father. The Father is wisdom. God is wisdom but because he is God and he is so much greater than us and our brains are small and limited by our own human limitations and by sin, we can't rightly comprehend that wisdom. We can't rightly understand who God is. We just don't have it in us. But Jesus is the word of God and he takes that incomprehensible nature of God and, and shows it to us in a way that we can understand. The Father is wisdom and Jesus is the word. The Father is the source, and Jesus is the way that w in which we can access the source. The Father's wisdom is something that we can't understand except through Jesus. Jesus helps us to understand the Father. When we hear Jesus' words, we understand how the Father thinks. When we see Jesus' life, we understand how the, the Father's character and the nature of who He is and the character and the nature that He wants us to, to display. When we see Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, we can understand the love that the Father has for us. When we see Jesus rising from the dead, we see his resurrection and his victory over sin and death, we begin to understand the power and the victory of the Father. The Father is the source. The Father is the wisdom. The Father is the power. And Jesus is the way in which we can understand those things. It is the, the power and the wisdom and the goodness of, and the grace and the love and the mercy of God worked out in human form. Kind of like in, in uh, Stranger Things, right? Now, there was a, a rumor circular lighting around on, on, face, on Facebook that I may have started this rumor that I was going to do a Stranger Things Christmas series. And that's not true. But I, I am going to mention Stranger Things because I think it will help us to understand the Gospel of John here. In Stranger Things, you have this, this fifth dimension, right? That's all around us all the time, but we can't perceive it. We can't understand it because it exists, it, it exists on another dimension. They call it the upside down. Basically, it's like the flip side of reality. So we live, we live here, and this, this, this upside down is right here. And so it's right, I mean, it's right next to us, but you can't, if you're up here, you can't see it. Does that kind of make sense? All right. And um, there's a character in Stranger Thing, Things named L, who has the ability to, to see and to understand what's going on in, uh, in, in the upside down. So she can kind of punch through reality and see what's going on on the other side of the, of the paper. 
And she can see and understand these things that are happening around them all the time, but they're just not aware of it. That's Jesus to us. Jesus came to communicate to us the reality that is around us all the time, the reality of God, the reality that we were created by him, that we were created in love, the reality that, that there is a, a creator that has, that has given us life and has taught us how to live. And when we fail to live according to the way that he has taught us, he set in motion a plan to redeem us and to forgive us and to bring us back to himself. That reality is all around us all the time, whether or not we see it or whether or not we comprehend it. And Jesus gives us the ability to understand that reality because we've been blinded by sin in our own lives. We don't, we don't understand it. We don't, we don't get it. We don't see it. We don't want to see it. And Jesus came to communicate those things to us. And then through his life and his teaching, he shows us what the will of that creator is what that creator wants for us. Through his, his death, he shows us the plan of redemption that God has, has spun into motion for us. He shows us that our sin has been forgiven. Through his resurrection, he shows us that he has power over creation, that God has power over his creatures, that God has power over us, that we are to obey God in the same way that even death, right? You ever think about that? When, God's, when God raised Jesus from the dead, dead, death, death, boom, sorry. When God raised Jesus from the dead, death had to obey him, had to give him up. And if death has to obey the will of God, then, then we are required to obey the will of God as well. He shows us that our sin has been forgiven. He shows us that God has power over creation and even over death. And this reality is, is, is all around us all the time. But a lot of times we just don't see it because we don't want to see it unless we look to Jesus. He goes on, he says, He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men, and the light shines into the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. it. Gives us two more pictures of who Jesus is. Jesus is life. He's true life. You want to know what it's like to, uh, to really live? It's found in Jesus, right? Life in the Bible, when the Bible talks about life, it's talking about more than just existing. It's talking about really living. And most of us have probably felt that way at one time or another. Anybody ever felt, you know, I'm, I don't know if I'm even living right now. I just feel like I'm existing. I just feel like I'm going through the motions. The Bible says, yeah, yeah, of course you do, because life is found in Jesus. And then he compares them to light in verses 6 through 9. It says, um, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. John was not the light, but he came to bear witness. He came to tell us about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. And so Jesus is the light. He's the true light. He's the true reality. You want to know what, re what is real? Jesus is the light. That's, that's what light does, right? If, if you can be in a dark room, there's stuff around you when you're in a dark room. You might get scared sometime when you're in a really, really, really dark room, right? If, if you do, it's because right, you don't know what's in there, right? You don't know what else is in there. The light shines into that reality that's always there. It's always there. You just don't see it without the light. And Jesus is the light. He is what is really real. Jesus is what is real. Jesus, you want to know what life is all about? Jesus is life. Jesus is wisdom. Jesus is, is purpose, Right? Colossians, the book of Colossians tells us that he is the image of the invisible God. We can't see God, but Jesus is our window into who God is. He is our window into this true reality that sometimes we have trouble seeing. In Jesus, in Scripture, with the Holy Spirit working in us, we can begin to see the things the way God sees them. And that's the big picture. You know, ever since humanity fell in the garden, ever since Adam and Eve fell into sin and we all fell in behind them, we all sometimes chose, chose wrong over right. We all chose our way over God's way at some time. Ever since then, we've had trouble seeing who God really is. We've been having trouble seeing things God's way. We see things our way and not God's way. And Jesus came to help us see things God's way. And we have a choice. 
Uh, if you go on, I think this is verse 11 or 12. We didn't really get that far uh, in the reading, but uh, um, it says he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Think about that statement for a minute. He was in the world and the world was made through him. So Jesus came to the world he created, right? The world that he made and we didn't recognize him. Reality is bigger than it looks to us. Just because we can't see something, just because we can't touch something, doesn't mean that it's not real. Reality is bigger than it looks to us in our own human understanding. And unlike in Stranger Things, this is where the metaphor kind of breaks down. In Stranger Things, the other side of reality is this terrifying world of death and, uh, and monsters. But in reality, in our reality, the other side, the, the reality that we don't see is good. It is a good God. It is a God who created us and a God who loves us and a God who has a plan to redeem us and a God who has a plan to restore the world that we are, we are destroying with our own sin. And that's when we realize God doesn't live in the upside down. We live in the upside down. We live our lives upside down. We live our lives separated from God, separated from his wisdom, separated from his love, separated from his purpose and from our destiny as his children. And Jesus came to show us what it looks like to live life the right way again. Jesus came to show us what it looks like to live life right side up again. But a lot of people don't recognize him because we're upside down and he looks upside down to us. But he's not the one with the problem. We're the one with the problem. We, we look at Jesus, we say, well, that doesn't make sense, right? But, but he's the creator God. If it doesn't make sense to us, it's not the infinite God's problem. He's not the one that's wrong, right? Does that make sense? It's like, it's like there, was a, there was a story I heard about a, a man and a woman, and they, were, when they, they, uh, they would drive to work together. They worked in the same place or worked down the street from each other. And he had this old pickup truck. And when they were first married, the man and the woman, she would, she would sit right next to him, be all cuddled up against him in the morning as they drove uh, to work. And as they had been married longer and longer, she was sitting farther and farther and farther away until later on in their marriage, she's sitting against the door kind of, Leaning, leaning against the door, kind of as far away from him as possible. And she looks over at him and she says, you know, you remember when we were first married? And we used to drive to work and we'd hold hands and just be cuddled up next to each other. He's like, yeah. Wasn't that nice? Don't you wish we could do that again? He looks over at her and says, I'm still in the same spot I've always been. I didn't move. God's not the one who moved. I'm the one who moved. If I'm not right with God, it's not because God moved, it's because I'm the one leaning against the door, not leaning against him. We live our lives upside down. We look at everything upside down. Let me give you an example. How many, you don't have to, to raise your hand or anything like that. Is anybody in here ever worried about bills, right? Anybody ever worried about finances? Anybody right now, maybe you're worried about finances, and you might, might say to someone, you know, the, the, you know I'm, I'm worried about the bills. I don't know how I'm going to make ends meet. You know, what can I do? Can Jesus help me with my bills? Well, maybe, I mean, maybe. But there's no promise in Scripture that says that he's going to. But that's not really the point. Well, we've got all this financial stuff going on. I've got to worry about that right now. Maybe, maybe later we can talk about Jesus. No, 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 no. That's not the point. Those bills are not the root of your problem. And some of y'all out there might be looking at me and be like, yeah, actually, yeah, the bills kind of are the root of my problem. You haven't seen my, uh, my checking account and you haven't seen all the bills that are coming into my house and the second notices and the third notices and the cutoff notices. Yeah, the bills are the, no, they're not the root of your problem. Why are you worried about finances? Why are we worried about finances? We're worried about finances because we're worried that we're not going to have enough and that we might lose that car that we've got. And if we lose the car, I'll lose my job. And then maybe I'll lose my house. I might not have enough food. I might be sleeping outside. I might, I might die prematurely, right? We're not worried about bills. We're worried about dying. And Jesus can help us with that. Death is the right side up problem. And Jesus came to defeat that. Maybe Jesus is going to pay your bills. Maybe he's not. But I know he can help you with the problem of death. You know, I think about another one, our relationships. You know, can Jesus make my wife come back? Or can Jesus make my boyfriend come back? Can Jesus make my estranged children love and respect me again? Well, maybe, you know. 
well, you know, I, 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 I've, I've got to worry about that. I've got to take care of that first. Maybe we'll talk about Jesus later. It's upside down. Why are you worried about that broken relationship? Well, I'm worried about that broken relationship because I love her and I really thought we were going to make it and I don't know what I'm going to do without her and I'm getting older now and I don't want to be alone for the rest of my life. There's the problem. The problem isn't the broken relationship. The problem is alone and Jesus can help you with that. He came so that we can have life. He came so that we can have a right relationship with the Father again and so that we can have right relationships with each other. Maybe he can't heal that broken relationship that you really want him to heal, but he can heal other relationships relationships and he can give you relationships with himself and with other people that can fulfill you. Right? The right side up problem is we don't want to be alone. It's not so much that girl or that guy or that child or that parent. It's that we don't want to be alone. Well, can Jesus help me? What about my job? Can Jesus help me with my job? I mean, maybe a little bit. He can probably make you a better person, which will probably make you a better employee. So, you know. Can Jesus help you with my help me with my reputation? You know, probably not. Jesus said the world's going to hate you as it hated me. So, yeah. <laughs> but it's upside down. Why are you worried about your reputation? Because a good reputation will open more doors, and I'll get that promotion. I'll get to do something that's more important and more valuable with my life. Something that people will respect. I don't want to just go through life. I don't just want to float through life doing something that doesn't matter. Purpose. That's the problem. Your reputation isn't the problem. Purpose is the problem. We were created to live with purpose, and Jesus can help us with that. Jesus can teach us how to live our lives right side up again. He can give us purpose. He can teach us how to live with, with, with love, how to love and to be loved how to have those right relationships. Jesus can teach us how it can, it can give us life. Those are the things that really matter and those are the things that he came to do. And Jesus is the window into that reality. The reality that tells us we were created to live eternally with an eternal God. The reality that says that we are loved with an everlasting love and no estranged children, no estranged parents, no messy breakup or divorce can, can change the fact that you are loved with an everlasting love this morning, that you have purpose. You're not just randomly here. And I'm not, I'm not necessarily even talking about in this room this morning. You know, I, I don't believe you're randomly here in this room this morning. Morning. I believe that you're here with a purpose, that God orchestrated you coming here this morning. And I don't know why, but I believe that you're here for a reason. Right? And I believe that you're here on this planet for a reason, that you were created to live for a purpose, right? that you were created to do something. You're not just randomly here. You were created, you were fashioned, you were formed and put here with a purpose. You were put here to love and to be loved. You were put here to build and to create like your God builds and creates. Our God is the most creative being in the universe and you were, you were put here to create, to, to paint or to, to play music or to, to build something. How many of you guys like to build stuff, right? You like to build stuff because your God likes to build stuff and he put that in you. You were created to, to imagine and to explore and to always in everything remember the one who made you that way, who loves you, who is redeeming you. That's what the world looks like right side up. And Jesus came to show us that this morning. If you don't know Jesus this morning, if you're not sure where you stand with him this morning, I just want to encourage you. Um, I'll be available after the service. Some of our other leaders will be available um, down front here. I just want to encourage you. You know, Jesus is the window into that greater reality. Jesus is the way that we understand the nature of, of who we are and who we were created to be. And Jesus is our redemption. You know, in our culture today, we, we get a little uncomfortable when we start talking about sin and how we're all sinful and fallen. But we instinctively, we know that there's something wrong with the human race. Anybody ever watch the news and be like, man, we're, we're, we're just the best people ever, Right? If you got a problem with me talking about sin, don't ever watch the news. Hey? There's something wrong with us. It wasn't intended to be that way, but it, but it is. And Jesus came to fix that. He took our sin upon himself. And he took the punishment for us. And he gives us his Holy Spirit to teach us how to live, to teach us who God is. 
and to help us to learn to live his way. It's a lifetime process. I ain't got it figured out yet. I, I, when I was like 19, I figured I'd have it figured out by now, but I don't. I figure maybe by the time I hit 60 or 70, I'll have it figured out, but now I won't. But over the course of my lifetime, he's going to teach me, he's going to mold me, he's going to make me more like himself. And one day, when I step into eternity, I will learn how to see things right side up. I'll learn how to live my life right side up. And until then, we just keep trusting and we just keep asking for forgiveness when we fail. And so I want to encourage you, if you've never done that, if you've never entered into a relationship with Jesus like that before, I want to encourage you, maybe today's, maybe today's the day, day to do that, to start learning how to live life right side up, to admit, and that's where it starts, to admit that I've been living my life upside down. I've been living my life in a way, my way instead of your way. And I want to learn how to live your way. Let's pray together.